there are a lot of other materials which ironically um, uh, are often competitive. Currently, the Frick Museum is being added on to not only in the style of uh, Carrere and Hastings of 1900 in New York, but also in the most exquisite limestone um, and marble. And I would venture to say that if Kevin Roach had gotten the job and done it all in hand-bolted uh, steel and glass, it probably wouldn't have cost any less. Um, uh, it, it has become a kind of one of those silly shibboleths. In any case, the car, the space for the car in front of the building, the notion that when you get out of the car, you put that experience behind you, you shift, the building takes on another relationship to landscape, and not a singular relationship to landscape, but a relationship to an axis of trees that emerges as the forest is cleared, a grove over here with another kind of orientation, and another facade expression, a third orientation here in relationship to another kind of use and another kind of site. Next slide, please. Then the question is how you also build a building um, what happens inside the building? The building is a rich co confluence. I, I would venture to say that Richard Meyer's diagramming of space <laughs> is um, um, a, a kind of indictment of the limitations of, of late modernism. That building should be open and closed, load-bearing and non-load-bearing, and particularly houses public and private, seems to me one of the more silly and uh, reductio absurdums of all time. A, who cares if a wall was load-bearing or, lo or non-load-bearing, as though that was the structure of a, di of a, a significant dialectic. But more importantly, why is it, what is it so public that happens in a house, for example? What is it so wonderful that a uh, space only exists in one realm rather than many realms? I would, so I made these drawings, um, and I believe that architecture is, um, as, a, as a watchword, architecture is intended or should be intended and conceived of as a critique of all other architecture. You make a building not just to solve some client who happened to ring you up that day's problems, but because you are interested in saying something about the thing you're involved in. So these drawings are meant to show that our house is unclear. It's many things. There is the experience of it coming in, and you see it one way. If you happen to be the owner, you, you see it. You can spend your entire time going from your bedroom to your living spaces and your kitchen, and the realm of of other activities uh, having to do with guests are taken away, are, are not part of your life, and so on and so forth, um, as you can read. It's the grayness, in that sense, of the, of the experience that adds the richness of it, not the black and white clarity of it. Uh, also, the question, next slide, please. Well, how do you make a building? What does this building supposed to look like? For so long, we, you know, uh, in school, we all have, in, all the architects in the room have in common that we went to school. And you know how we do it in school. We, do, we spend six weeks on a six-week problem doing the plan, one day doing the section, and then just before the review or crit or final, whatever it is, somebody says to you, oh my god, you need an elevation. So you immediately, like mad, draw the elevation. Then, then the rest of the life of the building, if it's a real building, everybody gets to look at the building as an elevation and seldom ever sees it as a plan or uses it. Most people don't go into the buildings they experience. Um, so the question is, what do buildings look like? Well, if you have no context to deal with, you have to make up your context. And this is in a very large a park, as you would state. It's um, in a place called Westchester County, where every style has been built known to man. So you have to make your um, context. So you make memories of Tuscany, because I like it, um, and the owner doesn't disagree. Uh, you make memories of Frank Lloyd Wright, because the last great time that American architecture could deal with landscape, site, car, um, the complexities of a house, um, was in the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright, it seems to me. You make um, uh, memories, you use what you find on the site. They were actually, these stones actually were there, and then you get some more in because you didn't have enough. And you make um, a place that is experienced in different ways as you move about it. The only way to experience a house like this, which is episodically com composed, is to move through it and around it, not to see it as a single moment um, as though it were an object on a coffee table. Next slide, please. Or if you're adding on, change the one on the right, oh, thank you. If you're adding on to, uh, if you're proposing to do a hotel uh, in a ski resort and you um, project as too utterly banal, the only prevalent style there, which is Heidi A-frame yodel houses. Um, that's, that is the prevailing ski lodge aesthetic in America. You, and you have to deal with a program which calls for Extension over time. So you must design a building that exists at the moment and exists in the future 
and in terms of its imagery, recalls not that horrible Heidi, Heidi House aesthetic. Um, and sometimes, you know, architects have to have their own opinions too, even if Heidi House is acceptable. I'm not that much of a populist. But um, rather looks back to the great lodges that were built in the Catskills uh, by the Quakers and other religious groups and in the American National Parks at Yellowstone and so forth, the great giant um, public spaces, uh, the kind of space making and imagery that in a certain way John Portman represents, though vulgar in terms of form. Here we try both to deal with the forms and the space making qualities. Next slide, please. Or if you make cities, and I think one cannot be, but be influenced by um, some of the uh, drawings and ideas of the Creer brothers. You make cities, and I, I certainly agree that in, the, in, in a certain point, you make cities in which the buildings are the, def the definers of public space. That is their principal role, Aaron and again at the Yale colleges, and that the buildings themselves could be rather boring. I don't say I want some other architect to do them. I'd like to do them myself and um, perhaps make them more interesting but not by making them more like a hoop de doo handstand, but by making them out of very nice materials. But at the first stage, at the stage of the city, it is the connection with the existing framework, the subterfuge of the big interventions that one must make by making them virtually invisible to the pedestrian. New York is so marvelous because you can stand at the bottom of the Empire State Building and not know you're there, that it's there. The Empire State Building exists in the grand landscape of New York, not like that tower at Tottenham Road dropping right down the ground and reminding you of its naked conceptual splendors. Um, and so this is the, the town and the context of the town and the context of the movement through the town first, the architecture of the buildings uh, second, and then of course also that for the first time this contextualism makes it possible to add on and incorporate an old building in the framework and not, I hope, to just isolate and maroon it as a kind of jewel in a, a, a forgotten man of some olden time. Next slide, please. Now, this contextualism has the most marvelous quality about it. For the first time, architecture, it is possible to believe that an architect designed his building after visiting the site. It, it's for the first time it is possible to believe that architects can be so civilized that they can build onto a building which they admire without destroying it or without being it's insisting on showing that they are more not only as clever but also differently clever. So you have Peter Millard's fire station of 1962 in New Haven, a building that's inserted into an, a landscape that is not really sympathetic to a fire station. It's a re residential neighborhood made up of shingle style houses, which do not show in this photo, and these white clabberded cottages of about the 1830s. So Millard takes his concrete, treats it as a false wall almost here, and shutters it to look like clabberding. And the corner boards are evoked as well. Then he takes certain elements like stair towers and um, volumes which hold uh, hoses and what, what have you, and does them in a dark brick that evokes the color of the shingled architecture, producing a building that is a hybrid, collaborative Gothic, if you will, and in which the essence of fire station is secondary to the essence of civility on the street. Then Aldo Jurgela adding on to Wilson Ayers uh, University Museum at the University of Pennsylvania does not so show, as say Gordon Bunchaf did at the Albright Knox, and we wait to see what Sandy Wilson is going to do at the British Museum, but I don't notice any columns yet. Um, um, but Jurgela says this is a wall-bearing building with holes punched into it and has a pitched roof. I will do a pitched roof. I will do a wall, not necessarily a bearing building. I'm not sure that this is really, that is the, the suggestion. It's a curtain of wall. It's not bearing. Um, and with windows punched in. And I will uh, continue that. As I come to the end of the building, which not only is the end of this moment, but because of considerations of sight, it will be the full extent of the building forever in this direction, um, I can burst out to take advantage of what you cannot see in this photo, but is a, three, is, a, is a parking bay for school buses of a vastly different scale from anything that Ayer and his colleagues had to imagine in the 1890s. Next slide, please. Or if you add on to a shingle style house, you can do it the way the American architect Peter Blake had done, um, uh, doing a little box-like projection here based in wood on the glass house of Philip Johnson. Um, I did not think that that was a very suitable uh, resolution to the difficulties of a room facing this garden or the completion of a kind of strangely incomplete um, uh, massing of the original house. So this uh, 
uh, porch like addition was added on. If I were doing this 10 years later today, I would have it much more white and gray, much more moldings, much more overt in its uh, evocation of the old building, but it was a tentative statement 10 years ago of my intentions. Next slide, please. Or the question of what happens if you deal with a context that you really don't like? I mean, it's one thing to deal with abstract yodel Heidi houses, but if somebody calls you up and says you're supposed to be sympathetic um, and um, you're the kind of architect who can add on to my house in a sympathetic way, give me something sculptural and inventive, but um, that looks like it belongs here, and you come in the driveway and you see this, and you sort of want to go away, but you need the work, and you're American and you're English and pragmatic, and you take the job. <laughs> so what does this mean? The question is, what is this? Well, the real thing, of course, is that it, is, it means something to people. The people who live in that house are not living there because they have to, but because they want to. And why? Well, this, these little rooftop um, ventilators to the attic, obviously to them, have some very definite connection in the back of their mind to Serleo and Palladio. And those Palladian windows that they know represent tone in architecture. And this door similarly has connections. It's a catalog number. But to them, with the carriage lamps and all of that, and the Venturis have studied that on the marketplace level, which this is not. This is an architect-designed house. Um, uh, uh, means something. So the question is how you design. Well, the first thing you do is you design the two of the things, your new thing and the old thing, together, not yours as though it was shipped in on a flatbed and happened to be placed next to it. Similarly, this whole notion of postmodernism, and I use this as a moment to comment on it, has been suggested as a kind of permissiveness. It is permissive. If by the fact that you mean permissive, that when you walk down the street, you don't hold your eyes over your head um, until you find a building that Nicholas Pevsner liked. You know, that's not the way um, the world is. It is permissive in the sense that it permits you to look at, to understand, and to comment upon in your own work everything you've seen and known. On the other hand, it is not permissive in the terms of the language of architecture that was touched on the other night by Bob Maxwell. That is, architecture is still a discipline of space and shape and structure and form. So I made these drawings, and I always make these drawings after the fact. You know, I think no building can be designed in axonometric or isometric. I've never seen anything, nor has anyone else ever seen a building in isometric or axonometric. And therefore, if you can't see it that way, why draw it that way? It's a great analytical tool, which is the way it was devised, and not a design tool. However, this building, which I'll show you a slide of in a moment, which may look extremely um, accommodating and random in certain ways and deferential not only to this house but to the site is based just like every Richard Meyer project on a square with a grid of columns and uh, its inflections are all in relationship to that and there is this logic of where the structure is and so forth. Normally I think architects should not talk about that sort of thing. It's like going to the dentist and having him tell you how he's filling your tooth. It's not very interesting. Just get on with it. But at the moment in time, since we want to have to comment on these things, I feel one has to say that those things are, are very much part of this work. And there is no more disciplined architect in terms of the method of composition than, for example, Bob Venturi. It just happens that his, this, his method is not confined to the sphere, cone, and cylinder, which have somehow been confused for the full extent of human possibilities in architecture. Next slide, please. And the building, when it's finished, with a little help from nature and a good landscape man, um, you can't see the old building with the new one. But as you move from one to the other, they're connected for, for zoning reasons. Uh, if you move from one to the other, you do not feel a completely jarring experience of time shift from 1784, say, to 1984, but rather a gradual movement and extension over time. And in fact, I like to think that this composition energizes many of the forms and attitudes which had become so completely um, flaccid in the, in the house of the mid-50s. Next slide, please. Now, the second principle I'd like to adumbrate for you today is the um, principle of allusion. That is that architecture is an act of cultural uh, statement. That you make a building alludes to a tradition of a place, wanting that. It sorts, seeks to make a tradition of the place through allusion that it um, uses many devices, uh, not, not most important of which is shape, uh, color, and memory, and other things to create these allusions. On the left is a project, probably intended always as a project, for something called a fountain house by two Argentinian 
um, um, uh, architects practicing in New York um, named Machado and Silvetti, now in Cambridge, actually. And the illusions are very rich, and um, you probably know the project with its morning beach, its afternoon beach, its cascade of water, its um, a facade wall, which doesn't show in this view, which has memories of the Villa Stein and Adolf Loos, among other things. And most importantly, its rooftop arcade and its arches, which are the, the, the now fashionable EUR scheme, um, how times have changed. And um, uh, from the rooftop EUR, you look down on the Italian garden. And so as the point is, it becomes completely clear to you that it's an Italian garden. It's in the shape of a map of Italy. Um, one has to, after all, one, one has to tell people that it's an Italian garden. Then, Charles Moore's house for Lee Burns in, in Santa Monica. Moore has done houses not unlike this in shape in, 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 in near the Sea Ranch, but the exterior expression, the design of the facades, has different materials and different references. He's done some in the East with different references. Here in Santa Monica, through the use of 18 different colors of paint, he gives you a perpetual sunset over the Pacific, which is handy because though it faces the Pacific, two giant high-rises lock the view most of the time, and you only get it for about two minutes a day, the sunset. So this time, so now you have it all the time, as you will, will have it. It also refers to the Spanish-Mexican tradition of, San, of Los Angeles, which is a made-up tradition to some extent. The Spanish were there, but when the real settlement came and took place in the turn of the 20th century, there really was no architecture of any uh, uh, strong quality in the place. And also the Mexican border is about 50 miles or 60 miles away. And so there is a, a discourse established in this architecture. Next slide, please. Or in the case of Michael Graves. Now Michael Graves is the architect of the five group, wh whom, and perhaps John Haydick, but he has built nothing, so I, I, I reserve my own opinions about it. I'm not sure enough to know what to say. But with Michael Graves, I think he is completely at sea in the group of the five. His architecture is not at all about um, what th those other three are interested in. And in fact, Charlie Guathme hired Michael Graves to paint murals on a job that he had done because, as Michael said, Charlie needed me to put back in the architecture everything he had taken out. <laughs> um, and I believe that's what Michael Graves' architecture is about. I believe it, uh, it's a postmodern architect. I don't care that he uses cubism, but he doesn't use, as his, as his point of departure, um, uh, its pastness is just as past as um, the shingle star or anything else. It is what one does with it, what one comments, what one adds to the discussion and the discourse. And I think he adds a great deal, the most important of which, and the thing that makes Eisenman the most upset, is that he adds a discourse about the human being, not since the architecture of humanism, it seems to me, have we had such conversation about where a molding is in relationship to your hip, your shoulder, your head, what it means to have a door in a, in a, in a wall, a window in a wall, what the nature of real windows and doors are and what they might be poetically, what, what it is to stand in the garden and have that at one's head, and suddenly the base of the building becomes at one's shoulder, the nature of color in relationship to landscape, and so on. I think that um, even, even this pitched roof, which Michael tells me he did especially for me because I had made a comment on a previous building of his, it would be awfully nice, it would relate a lot better to the house behind it. It had a pitched roof, so Michael said to me, how do I like it? And I stood there in sort of mute splendor, and I kept commenting about all the other things. He said, but you're not noticing the main thing. He gets very upset, and, the main, and I finally said, oh, I get it. And of course, this gable connects up with the gable of the Victorian house, which it's added. And of course, you complete it with your eye, all of which seems to put the user, the viewer, everybody back in the game again, and, and connecting us up. Four Venturi's, two houses for Trubeck and Wislocky, two brothers-in-law who uh, have these summer houses on Nantucket off the coast of New England. You know, I believe it's Wislocky who's the poor one, and Trubeck is the rich one. Um, and they are based on these fishermen cottages, and Wislocky gets one that's really not very different. I'm sure Leon Korea goes crazy when he sees these houses. I think I heard there was a little uh, discussion about them last summer. But, but um, th this house is, um, uh, the owner says it's learning from Fort Dix, which is one of our major military bases, which has lots of little cottages like that, which they stuff four or eight men to be very unhappy uh, for their military service in. But when you get to the next house, so this takes a local vernacular and just alludes to it, rather closely duplicates it, it seems to me. And the next house is the house where the guy has a little more money. 
One thing is, he has, you know, he has more money because he can afford to throw some of his house away. <laughs> that is an allusion to the modern movement. All the modern movement, with its great talk of social purpose and so forth, has thrown away more parts of the building that used to count for things. What is it that's going to be done under all those buildings at Roehampton? Um, then the other thing is, you know, he has more money because he has this wonderful allusion to class, to style, to, uh, to the grand tradition. That Palladian window, or Surlian window, is what really sucks it home, what really makes it a bigger thing, a more important thing, a culturally referential thing. It's as though the fishermen coming to the place had suddenly got some money and had brought in a, car a carpenter builder from the town. That would have happened 200 years ago. In that sense, that is being reiterated by Venturi today. Next slides, please. Or in this townhouse we did in, on, on, on Park Avenue in New York, um, it's improbable, even in the States, to do a townhouse these days. And how do you make a townhouse that anybody who uh, would be willing to pay that kind of money for a townhouse and didn't want an out-and-out -out, um, copy, and maybe that's legitimate, of some other townhouse, how do you make it so he really believes he's gotten a townhouse and not a converted garage? Um, uh, so um, we, we set out, well, the one thing that townhouses are is they're neoclassical. Even if they're Gothic in, comp in, in detail, they're always base, shaft, and capital. So ours is base, shaft, and capital in its general part T. In addition to which, there, were some old, there was a portion of this thing that stood before, and we kept it so it has a little memory from the past. In addition to which, we made pilasters with our own little uh, tentative uh, capitals there. And then we even composed the uh, rooftop motif to it, it suggest a triangle, a pediment, and um, uh, also we undercut it in a certain way so you can sort of lift it up and take it home with you, if you like, in your mind's eye. You can do things in relationship to it. In, in doing this building, more importantly almost than, to me than the building itself, is the things one discovers about the buildings next to it. Those New York apartment houses, and there are some like them in London, but more in many, many more in New York, were always designed as though they were townhouses at the bottom, and then rather dumb for many floors above, because nobody looks at it. Only architects walk around like that, myself included. And um, real people talk straight out. And um, therefore, you design the bottom of the building, and you look straight ahead. And uh, you, if you can make this part of the building, the very part of architecture that the modern movement threw out, if you can rebuild it, so another of my fantasies is to go to Roehampton and have the commission to do the, the, the ground floor of all the buildings um, and um, cover up all those POT, put shops in and whatever. That is the part of architecture that one really needs to define a streetscape. So in that sense, this building participates in that rather long-standing conversation. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that um, th this, uh, under this rubric of allusion, I'd like to suggest another footnote to explain this project, which is not shown here, but I think is in uh, the, mag the magazine in AD. The suburb is one of the, is the, one of the few achievements of the Anglo-American tradition within the modern times. It is a great invention of, of the English, of which the Americans took, transformed, and um, in a certain way destroyed with the automobile. The reason they allowed the automobile to destroy it is because the international movement, the modern movement, had no alternative for the suburb and had no idea about it, refused to deal with it, so that it allowed it to grow so we, with, with no theory except the, the premonitions of Frank Lloyd Wright, who was um, more acting more in anger than in, in thoughtfulness when he did Broadacre City, um, there, it, it grew without any theoretical base from architecture. It's the ignored problem. Similarly, suburban architecture has no theoretical underpinnings, whereas you go to Bedford Park, you see what Shaw did, and then you see for 20 years that the builders could build what Shaw did and could elaborate it. Since we as architects have never faced the suburban problem in, our, in, in, in the 20th century, not since the modern movement at least, um, we give the builders and the marketplace no images. So this project, which was done for the Biennale last year, is intended to make images, for, to revivify images and start the ball rolling toward making new images for the suburb, to, to set the record straight that the suburb isn't this vast uh, sort of swallowing up of land necessarily at the yet further remote reaches of the city, but can be anywhere in the city that London, in fact, is a collection of suburbs, um, more or less, or villages. And that areas, in the case of the states, 
uh, at the ends of subway lines which dip into tunnels nearer to the town, uh, to the center of the city, or in the case of London, for example, across the river, it would be a perfectly a a good analogy, uh, abandoned industrial areas and railroad yards. The way to redevelop such sites is not to put in high rises and thousands more people that were ever there before, as though somehow there was a great excitement about living in at the uh, 45 minutes by a, a rotten subway ride from Times Square, as though the, uh, the same excitement as though one lived in Times Square. But in fact, to face the fact that this kind of development, a single family house on a lot of 60, uh, 40 rather, by 60 or 100 feet, um, that a small neighborhood park, like a Regency Crescent, um, like backyards, front yards, possibilities of expansion so the building can exist over time and people don't have to keep moving as they have more children, um, uh, possibilities for introduction of personal statement in the architecture um, over time without offending the architect or costing so much money that the owner can't afford it are viable propositions that must be studied. Next slide, please. Now, what are the images of the suburb that are viable? Well, in the eastern part of the United States, the northeast, there are two. One, and these are workers' houses, is, is these cottages were built by a mill in Maine in 1884 by John Calvin Stevens, a very distinguished um, shingle-style architect uh, illustrated in Scully's book. They are a really civilized idea of how people might live in a, in a relatively close community. These are for workers. Um, the second image, next slide, that one might explore is the so-called um, Jeffersonian Palladianism, which I understand is very trendy right now in London because of that big, splashy Palladio show, which, interestingly enough, hasn't even gotten to New York yet. Uh, uh, but um, these, this development of suburbia, you might think, was built some 50 years ago. But in fact, it's red off, hot off the presses. It was built in Charlotte, North Carolina, about 1976. And it is there to show you a variety of things. One, no matter what architects will say, people do like this sort of thing. Two, that it can still be done rather well. That is, its projection is terrible, but that's actually quite a good uh, take on um, Westover or one of the, the um, uh, mansions along the, uh, the uh, James River in Virginia. And it's a viable proposition all around. You can even get the bricks and all the other stuff, and people can lay it up, despite all the polemics to the contrary. What it is not viable, of course, is it's very lavish here. Big states and big houses. But you can take that image, as so many English architects did in the 19th century, and you can divide it and subdivide it and keep manipulating it so that four families can live in that house. The Crescent can serve, instead of 10 houses, four fa 40 families. Um, and you could still have all the appurtenances that are necessary for the image, the place for the car in the front that can be polished with great splendor on Sunday the walkway to the front door, the, the uh, sense of piano nobile, the roof, which is good for uh, many uh, storage and for insulation. And then since there are no fireplaces, you put the uh, rooftop air conditioners up there or the flues. All of that imagery can be made viable, uh, different but the same, recognizable in any case. Next slide, please. Who, who built that? Nobody built that, but we're, we're, um, I designed it, but I'm, I'm ready for, if you've got a developer, I'm ready. Uh, it's a purely speculative project. Um, done for the Biennale, and I keep working on it. And uh, this project, which is a, an attempt to turn that into some a particular site, is for housing on a scrubby site at the edge of suburbia, which is intended for old people who, you know, who have houses, but the kids say, oh, you can't afford to pay that mortgage anymore, Mom. Why don't you move into one of those nice houses that the church is building, you know, with HUD money? And so they build this sort of thing out there. And the, way, the image that you usually get, if it's that good, is sort of Atelier 5, sort of uh, those things that you slide into the bottle rack without the bottle rack, you know, ratcheting along the landscape. And it's very hard for most people to imagine why it is they have to leave a th single family house with four walls, four sides, even if the yard is yay big, it's still th that psychological separation. It looks like a house. But to move into this sort of thing, and um, uh, there's some stuff over um, on the north side of Hyde Park um, that I was taken to that looks meant to be very snappy by, um, I think, Neve Brown. And it's very accomplished, but it's that kind of thing. And I, I think people are going to have a little trouble adjusting to that new world they're being forced into. Uh, but th so this intends to take a house form and to put four flats in it and to use the site planning of Jefferson's um, University of Virginia, which is a very viable model. Jefferson seemed to project and understood 
almost better than anyone else, the compromise necessary in American planning between the ideal image, the mall, and the necessary realities of servicing his mall, which he had the same problems as we did. And so um, I think that that model works very well for this project. Next slide, please. Having so said, even the architecture of Jefferson's mall, those wonderful, and these were faculty houses, and really not all that grand even in terms of today, and certainly not in terms of those days, um, those can serve very well to set the tone and memory of our own development. Next slide, please. The third uh, little essay in context and illusion uh, th that I'd like to show you is for a suburban town by the ocean in Florida. I mean, you drive 1,800 miles to go to this, uh, your one-week vacation, one week you've spent driving, uh, two weeks um, back and forth. You come here, and this is what you find. This is beautiful Singer Island by the sea. And it's just a big roadside hot dog stand scene, and I don't share the Venturi's love. I think one should learn to understand and deal with, but I really can't love it very much. So our proposal is to line that with an arcaded system of um, uh, lattice work with many images and memories of Spain and the Mediterranean cultures. Now, the reason you might ask why, next slide, please, is very simple. Why those images? When Florida was turned into a resort in the early part of this century, Florida was a, was a swamp, you know. Some still agree that it is a swamp. Um, it's a pretty, it, it's one of those terrible places in America that you can do anything to, like Los Angeles. It has one of the more agreeable climates. You can make it into any image you want. If you'd wanted to turn it into to Nome, Alaska, I think you could probably have pulled it off. Um, when it was built, it, it mostly developed at the time of the First World War when, when American rich could no longer go to Deauville or the Mediterranean resorts or to the Lido because of the difficulty of the torpedoing of the boats and so forth. So Addison Meisner, who's a very clever fellow in Palm Beach, said, I know what we'll do. We'll turn Palm Beach into all of those places at once. We'll get all the people you see happy. And, and it's one of the few successful American urban places. Um, you have to go to a resort to find an Amer a successful urban place, Disney World or whatever it has. Are you really thinking about the Texas? Yes, yes, yes. Um, well, it's a new time, new, new things happening. Uh, it has arcaded streets with shops where you get put the car behind you. And even though the car didn't exist then, it, it really is a viable proposition now. It has arcades along the streets to protect you from the sun and allows each shop to identify itself uh, in the street. And it has marvelous little things you keep coming upon. And it's capable of changing and growing over time. Now, the, 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 the situation in Florida now, however, is more represented by this which is, for example, this is the kind of motel one would find on Singer Island when one were to go there. I always love this photo because it reminds me of that photo in the Architectural Review or Forum, I can't remember which, of the Bauhaus after the West East Germans had gotten hold of it after the <laughs> Second World War. That is, unfortunately, the language of international style as it becomes vulgarly applied and exists all over the states. More important, one other thing I wanted to point out to you is in another Florida town, not Palm Beach, but Carl Gables, a very planned town with them, also with marvelous uh, public spaces. We can argue about this later. Um, this is the public swimming pool. All of you who have ever been to a public swimming pool in the States or here know that it's always like being prepared for Belson. You know, you go in there and they strip you all down you and run into 27 showers. Um, so you have some horrible disease. And then you go into this dank, huge thing which is being ready for some Olympics of the future with all the charm of chain link fence and lines painted on it and a, a horrible odor of chlorine wafting in the air. And there is no one, one idea about delight or pleasure in that experience. And you wonder why nobody wants to go to a public swimming pool. Here, this is the public swimming pool of Carl Gables. Perfectly simple. It's as big as everyone. Instead of being a rectangle, it's got a meandering shape. There's a wonderful bridge, a la Venice, that takes you to an island, completely man-made. In other words, it's like a big swimming raft in the center, but it's made to look naturalistic. Then the building where they de-louse de you or whatever is turned into an Italian palazzo. Why not? It's just as nice as anything else. And then to, to occasionally, instead of gasping for breath and drowning, you can grab hold of one of these uh, gondola tie-ups. <laughs> there are no gondolas, but then, you, then your little, um, you transform your little raft that you bring from home into a gondola. So you can make wonderful games. I haven't found a game yet that I can play in that building. 
So we began to play games with the games, and that's what we did. And then at the only place in this whole town where you can actually see the ocean from the village, and the only reason you can is because there's a public parking lot for the beach there, <laughs> we raised up the entry a little. But those of you who know America know that this is not a singular experience, this kind of thing. This is everywhere. Um, so we made a, a, a monument to the town, and we took the sailfish, which is the thing everybody wants to catch one of and put over his fireplace at home, and also happens to be the symbol of the town, and we transformed it into a monument, saving you an additional two and a half hour drive to the giant Mickey Mouse at Disney World. Next slide, please. <laughs> now, the third point, and I think the hardest point, because I really think that though we might have some debate about what illusions are and whether one likes this particular thing or not, I think everybody agrees that architecture needs to deal at this moment with some kind of reference system beyond its own making. The third point is, and it comes down to the most important way of how to achieve it, is the question of ornament and ornamentalism. I would submit that the vertical plane of the building is not something that should just go away, um, like uh, uh, Norman Foster or Kevin Roach wanted to do, or that it should just simply reflect you. Supposing I'm having a bad day, I don't really want to see myself at Ipswich all that much. Um, it has to tell its own story. I would submit that its own story is not really enough to tell about its own making, that it has to have other things, that there is a need to ornament buildings, like there is a need to ornament ourselves in relationship to the situation we find ourselves in, the right suit or no suit or whatever. Now, in the modern movement, ornament was, you know, um, was, uh, Lowe said it was sexual perversity, aligned it with sexual perversity. Um, and then it had to come in in some way or other. So the only kind that was permitted, according to Johnson and Hitchcock, based on Lowe's, was integral ornament. You could have integral ornament in two or acquired ornament. You could have integral ornament in two ways. You could use extraordinary materials like book matched marbles, hand polished chrome casings on columns, a wonderful play of many glass surfaces endlessly reflected and tinted and so forth, superb travertine. We're all familiar with that. Or you could bring the ornament in from the outside, the approved Museum of Modern Art ornament package. Every Skidmore Owings and Morrow lobby with one Miro tapestry, one Giacometti sculpture for that human image, just so necessary in all that abstraction, and one Alexander Calder whirling away to remind you of the wonders of the air conditioning system. <laughs> that was okay. For the poorer of us who couldn't afford that, we could go to Ben Thompson's design research in the States and buy a Merameco ba banner um, um, as something to cover up the incredible whiteness and abstraction and negativeness of the wall. You know, you've all seen the movie The Knack. Once they, paint, once they paint that room white in the knack, I cry for the whole movie. It was a beautiful room with dark panel walls, and it gets all the, you know, they move in there. And the first thing they do in Swinging London in 1966 is paint the movie, the room white. And what do you do with it then? You just have to, you're just a sort of a, a, a trapped in this empty landscape. In any case, or if you take the, the, the idea of integral ornament, you carry it to the extreme of the Seagram building, the magnificent extreme. How many people are going to build a bronze building for starters? I mean, that's rather a costly way of going about the whole thing. This, and you know what happens to Mies when it's not in bronze and when it's done by Emery Roth or Richard Seifert or whatever. It doesn't quite make it. Or how many, how many times have you read how these Mayans are justified in, in structural terms? Well, it's true. You can engineer the building so the Mayans do do work. But you can also engineer the building, or you can try to, so that there are no Mayans, as in the John Hancock building, and they'll get it right eventually, and the glass will stay up. Um, the point is that the Mayans are, Mies understood that the corners of his buildings, the Mayaning and so forth, the color of the glass, and all of that were essential ingredients to the need to ornament these things. These were not skin and bones aesthetic at all. It is decorated in the most difficult and expensive way of doing it. Next slide, please or the Corbusian experience with, with no ornament. You know what happened at Pesach, he just simply produced marvelous housing, utterly flexible and utterly useful dwelling units, and just added a little dash of color. But what happens is there is, while there is marvelous expression of the totality of the community, there's no expression of the individuality of the in inhabitant, though the housing plan is all about the conversation between individual and communal life. So, you know what happened over the time from uh, Boudon's book, and you can well imagine what Le Corbusier thought when he found this Charles Jenksian face with these marvelous gumdrop eye eyelashes here, and the, 
really great improvement over the horizontal window so that it really frames views and you can curtain it and you can have a little privacy and so forth and so on. And obviously, a great deal of Le Corbusier's post-war style, for me at least, can be explained in terms of his unhappiness with that situation. So in La Tourette and other buildings, he made it so that they would never be changed by anyone. One, he made them out of concrete, so you have to blast them. You have the, the most dense concrete. <laughs> Two, he made the most sinister set of shapes imaginable. All rooms became decorative things. I mean, if you are ever uh, hang gliding or, or, or helicoptering around, I suggest you don't bail out there. Um, <laughs> three, he, he took the concrete and he did everything he could to its surface so that it would defy the graffitiist's art. You know, your pen will never make it across the surface without breaking the felt tip point. And then four, even when he came to decoration, because he had learned at the Armée de Salut, du Salut that the glass wall had a tremendous number of problems vis-à-vis -vis the light, he, he used the mullions in a decorative way. Or so I used to think until I read my Corbu more clearly, and I discovered to my horror that that is a composition from one of those revoltingly um, untuneful uh, composers named Xenakis, who uses some non-existent instruments to play. And you can actually play these mullions. Um, um, and so that you see that the, the lack of courage in the architect's own sensibility to organize a building on purely visual terms is, is incredible. You have to get a composer in to compose your mullions. Next slide, please. <laughs> it's absurd, but it's true. Or you can do what Charles Moore's described as decorating with the most ridiculously trained toilet pipes in the world, as in Kahn's laboratory at Richards. Now, it makes sense in a laboratory like Richards, where bringing the fresh air in and exhaling the um, uh, other uh, the, the noxious fumes uh, has something to do with the poetry and the function of the building. Although there's much to be said about the exaggeration of the size of this feature in relationship to the structure and the whole language of the building becomes rather muddled. Or you can, and I don't know if you can see it, but you surely know what I mean, you can expose the ceiling. You can let it all hang out. And that we, to that, I'm afraid, we owe the brutalist tradition from this country. It's all hanging out, but what a tyranny. Every partition, every move you make is no longer not only in relationship to walls and floors, but also to the ceiling. You can, you know, there's only no freedom. And I think if you go to the Richards Lab and hundreds of buildings like it, you begin to sense that tyranny at work and what it does to the users and how clever they are about getting rid of it. Next slide, please. Or in the case of Rudolph's Art and Architecture Building, which in a way is the quintessential modern movement building in this area of wanting to make a building palpable as a decorative object, but not knowing how, or knowing, or going about it in the most peculiar ways, you get everything put together. You get the concrete surface, which a man hung for six weeks, and I watched him is every day from the uh, drafting room of the Con building for us, hand chipping the concrete to expose the aggregate. Or you can get the whole thing that the floor plane is, is letting it all hang out, 43 levels on seven floors. Or you can get the fact that the painters are put up here in these great beams, which turn out not to be beams, but really rooms. And um, you know that's not one of the great lighting schemes ever conceived for, for making of easel art. Or you get the fundamental expression of these towers, as though it was, you know, maybe architects do give off a lot of hot air, I agree, but not that much. And it's a building that, in fact, with all its expression of mechanicals, isn't even air conditioned and is almost intolerable in the spring and fall. So the building doesn't work. And then when you get the art put in, the, the applied art, as this uh, almost invisible and quite cor correctly so, paperclip sculpture by uh, Joseph Albers, I mean, uh, you get the diminution of modern movement in art as well as in, in architecture, kind of sighing and collapsing on the wall. Or back here, if you can fairly see it, there's a column, which I suppose in the mind of Bob Eggman, that sculptor was to be to Trajan or something like that with all the story of the building and the people who helped make it. In fact, it looks like some terrible sort of misplaced um, a sauna tube on the site because it can't survive against the building. Only thing that can survive, and I think this is the real point, is the traffic lights, this great Russian constructivist sculpture projecting across the street because it is the size it has to be. Its energy is for what it has to be, and that's all. If you want to decorate a traffic light, go ahead and do it, but don't make it bigger to decorate it. Don't inflate it. Next slide, please. So the question, so that, that sets the scene for this very important fundamental drawing of Venturi's. Why not just make a building and put a sign on it, he said. 
And of course, it's perfectly true, and you know the argument so well. It, there, are, there is room in architecture, I would submit, for buildings that are ducks, in his phrase, and sheds. He sometimes takes, tends to be, in this sense, an extreme modernist, um, modern movement type, by always taking an A position as white or gray or black, but not recognizing both. But I think, in reality, he would uh, agree that you could have either kind, and he's just more interested in this at the moment. But more important than that, or, or equally important, is Arthur Drexler having the Beaux-Arts show in New York. One that's important is that it was, of course, not had in Paris. The last people who will discover the importance of the Beaux-Arts are surely going to be the French. I mean, they, they uh, still, I noticed in the French day a couple of days ago, are very uptight about the tradition of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. And they still see it as a planning tradition. Now, when Drexler had the show, it was very interesting he did not have plans. He only had this kind of drawing. And our learned critics, like Mr. Goldberger and Mrs. Huxtable, all said, oh, well, this is for students to know you're supposed to draw. And they had all the little homilies and lessons for the public. But I think they missed the main point. The point was that Arthur Drexel was showing you temple on temple on temple, endlessly, room after room of them. And what was different was that they were decorated differently. You could remember the temples if you were just into color by the colors. If you had a little learning of classicism, and people in the 19th century, any educated person at least did, you could start telling the stories about the temples from there. And of course, if you can read a little of those languages, you could read the things. So you take a type and you change its meaning by what you do in decorating the meaning. Next, decorating it. Next slide, please. It is significant that Drexler, who was invoked by Peter Cook quite correctly, is the Museum of the, well, he didn't say it, but the Museum of the History of Modern Art. There should be a slide there. Um, uh, is, uh, can you go back one? Is it, is it stuck? It might be stuck. Maybe if you can coax it up. Uh, in any case, um, uh, is now doing an exhibition on, um, he's not, <laughs> Charles Moore is about to levitate. Um, here it comes. <laughs> well, it's good when it gets there. Okay. Um, if I could only help. Um, in any case, um, uh, uh, Drexler is going to do a show on all of this stuff and much more. And he's um, uh, and, and the Bozo show is like an opening chord for that very um, uh, idea. And he's also going to do a show on Sir Edwin Lutyens, which should make everybody in Bloomsbury very, very nervous, also. Well, that, that's enough because I can get the idea from that, and everybody else can. Venturi introduced the idea of applied ornament to enhance and to um, expand on an architectural statement without uh, taking away from its basic energy in this Visiting Nurse Association of 1962 in a little suburban town outside of Philadelphia. Because the building has accommodations in its basement, people work there, it needs windows, the basement and, it, and their, their ta tasks are made more dignified by the same kind of molding that Charles Jenks is obviously able to find with some reasonable ease in um, some London lumber yard in which you can find all over the states, um, the no modern movement notwithstanding. Charles Moore has produced a whole language of interior decoration called super graphics. You can now go into Bloomingdale's, our sort of Harrods or a Habitat shop um, kind of place, and you can buy kits, and you can learn how to paint your, your kid's room in super graphics. Moore, of course, in response to the inarticulate modernist interior, takes the super graphics and not only does he manipulate it in the two-dimensional plane, but these are actually layers of plywood, giving you a whole surreal world almost, or a transform world beyond the space you're in, and also producing places to put all the kinds of things that the modern movement told us we couldn't have. Not only the little goodies we picked up on our travels, uh, life-size statues of Shirley Temple, ancestor <laughs> portraits, Great Aunt Maud's wedding present, and so on. Um, and, um, and, and that those things are all reintroduced into the vocabulary of our architecture through the reinvestigation of the wall and its possibilities. Next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah. OK. Now we got it in, we can't get it out. Sort of a sadistic thing to do to Shirley Temple, burn her out in ArtNet. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, another thing is that you can take perfectly ordinary wall, just windows, and you can compose them reasonably well. These are off the catalog at, uh, windows. And you can take the molding that starts out being part of the window design and extend it 
and you could transform the windows into some rather grander rolling references to classicizing architecture. Or you could take the existing necessary roof flashing and by painting another stripe the same color below, you could produce a cornice that really taps the building. You could take the parging of the facade foundation and just extending it up under the window, make it seem so much bigger. All on the surface, just in terms of the language of architecture in relationship to classicizing language. Well, let's, let's, we don't have to worry about it. I think it's, let's not have deja vu. Why don't we just stop? Okay, because I think the point is made um, quite well uh, at this point. I think the hardest thing to illustrate of the third points, I did have one thing of, of mine besides that that I wanted to show, but it's not important, is the, is the fact that people are once again being, talking about decoration. Soon they will look at decoration, and I think that the whole revival of interest in 30s, yes, yeah, so could you change one slide on this side? 30s architecture. Uh, that was not of the modern movement, but what we call uh, erroneously Art Deco, um, is because those buildings were ornamented and really de dealt with the vertical plane in a comprehensible way. In this townhouse in New York on the inside of the building, all of this point was made very clear to me by the owner, who specifically instructed me to produce a work of architecture that when it was finished, he would not have to finish with buying art and putting things in. He's obviously, from the photograph, you can tell someone who could afford to buy art if he wanted to. Um, but he said he didn't want to. He, knew, he was convinced he would buy a Picasso Cubist painting, and somebody would come in and say it was a marvelous Juan Gris, and he would be embar too embarrassed to tell him it was a Picasso for fear he'd forgotten what it was he'd bought to begin with. His honesty was touching, and it, it created an interesting architectural problem. So one thinks of what architects have always done. They've organized the wall into paneling. No good Georgian house is without paneling. Even this ceiling, which is hardly high style architecture, has a, a, a kind of organization, a gridding of its plane. Um, and, and so by doing that, you allow for where pictures might be placed, gives them an order for them, or no pictures at all. And you can modulate the space, not only by a few bumps that are necessary because of features of the planning of the building, but also in the vertical plane and color and decorative lighting and all kinds of other things can also be brought to a frank pleasure in decoration. So it's a long, hot morning, and um, I think I could stop at this point by one, as I started to suggest, this point is the hardest point to make about this new postmodernism, because decoration is the thing we've all been taught is death of architecture, that it's crime. Um, We've been told that the styles are a lie by Le Corbusier. I think that's absolutely true, and isn't it wonderful? You can take, somebody said the hotel I was staying in was the first steel frame building in, in, in London. It seemed to me one of the most unimportant things imaginable. It was a marvelous French palace. That's what I liked about it. Sure, it's a lie. I'm not interested in the steel frame building. I'm not interested in how many ribs I have inside beyond a certain crude point of knowledge. I'm interested in my physiognomy in the, in the in the broader sense, and I think we've had our architectural values rather twisted about for 40 or 50 years. The world has gone on perfectly happily um, without us, and we, we beat our breasts, and we try more sociology, we try more um, environmental controls, we try everything but architecture. And I would say that what this postmodernism is about is the first serious conversation about what architecture was, can be, hasn't been, and perhaps might become again. And I'm willing to talk about it, and only about that, um, but for as long as anybody would like to talk and ask me questions. Thank you. Are there questions? I, I should point out, I pointed out to the, I've talked to quite a few English students in other universities, and I have to say that I'm an American and I can be insulted, you see, because Americans are rude and they will insult back. So you don't have to be polite. Um, uh, there was a question here. The Pompidou Center by, by my old friend Richard Rogers. It's one of the most marvelous pieces of 19th century design I've seen yet. It's fabulous. I mean, it's exactly what I'm not interested in, um, but, but it is a great modern movement building. I mean, Viola Le Duc meets Peter Cook's early phase perfectly. Um, uh, other than that, I'm not, uh, you know, it's great. And I think that one of the things that I think Charles Jenks mentions in the book, 
or in the magazine or whatever. I mean, there's so much I get confused, and I agree with him 100% is that the postmodernist position allows you to not only like and appreciate this other, this modern movement work, but to incorporate it. There is a moment for that. I, unfortunately, when I was there, I couldn't get into the building, so I only see it from the outside. I don't know if the moment is correct on the inside. The outside it has a fabulous, actually, it's contextually quite good. I hate the colors, but the richness on the outside is equivalent to me to the richness of uh, Notre Dame and fits in amazingly in that place. So in that sense, if, I wish he had done it that way. If he had said, I'm putting all this stuff on the outside so I can make a gothic, a neo-gothic exterior, I'd have loved it that much more. But I still think the results are very powerful. Uh, it's uh, very difficult. It's not what you're supposed to do, Charles, but I'll get you tonight. And I've heard you talk two times already, so I'm, I, I have my questions prepared. Even if you deviate from your New York text, I can tell, remind you of what you said, but go ahead. You showed all my slides. I don't know what you said. Well, I don't know. No, because I didn't mean to convey the fact that I was some sort of uh, neutral vegetable standing up here at the drawing board. I have my own interests. I think Lucien, the difference is that while the Corbusier, although he would never do it, but his apologists would say there was an, a way of doing architecture, no style, which of course meant the international style. I said there are many styles. Lucien Kroll, I, I don't happen to like his buildings. I, I haven't seen them in first hand, but I'm, you've tried very hard to get me to like them. And I just think they're ugly. He probably thinks mine are ugly. But we can both exist now for the first time in a civilized way because our intentions, our philosophy, is to make references to all kinds of situations and to incorporate it in the buildings. A longer-ranged view will require, you will require it, of course, it seems to me, to find out who, if, if one of us was more successful than the other, or perhaps we were both successful. We could both operate. It's a big world. I like Erskine's Sorry. buildings. If I, could. Yeah. I don't think Lucien Cole has aesthetic. That I do have that argument. I don't see it. I think it's a collage or a jumble of a lot of things. I don't see. I don't see allusion or a larger idea. Well, maybe I have to see it. But I have been to Biker Wall, and I think it's very interesting. Well, I mean. Well, if I'm going to, but you see, if, I, if you ask me, and just ask me, and I will, uh, to do a building for Bedford Square or something like that, I'll try to tune into that. I mean, I think one of the things the students always ask me, well, how do you know how to do this kind of work? And um, I thought maybe I could sort of talk about that a little more on, at the AA. Um, but first of all, you got to know about architecture and architectural history. Now, these happen to be things that were interesting to me that week. And where, where I was then, if I were building in Bedford Square or if I were building in uh, Brussels or, or uh, uh, some other place with another context, I don't think I could walk right in like Corbusier and do it on the back of a napkin um, as he did for Rio. You know, he sailed into the harbor and he had Rio all sized up and he had a city for five million for Rio. Um, I don't think I, I could go about it that way, but I do think that I could learn 
and understand and put my contribution together with what I found. And I think that's a very different thing. I, I literally designed not this building, but the Lang House, which I didn't show, which is wandering around somewhere on your board, and that pool house in Connecticut, one being very shingle style, picking up on the, at the same time, they were literally in the office at the same time, designed at the same time. That was the thing that Saarinen used to do, it used to drive his colleagues crazy. How can you do Yale and IBM together, they'd say to him. But I, so I don't, I, I do have formal preferences a hell of a lot. I'm loaded with prejudices. Also, when I travel, as I came here, I mean, I, my whole purpose of doing this was, oh, I love to sound off and all that and be immortal, but I wanted to see lots of things I hadn't seen in London. And I take all these slides, and I make notes, and even occasionally a drawing, and I guarantee you I'm not doing them to build up the art library at uh, Columbia. I, to give a cl I, I use them to copy and to look at and to think about. And I think that's why architects used to travel and why they really always travel, but they lied about it. And I think that's why everybody should travel and look at these buildings and build up a collected memory. And uh, that, that's what I think architecture is in large part about, what clients expect. Whether it's the first question a client asks an architect it comes as a terrible shock to all the uh, uh, modern movement uh, uh, apostles, is what is the building going to look like? And I've had it asked to me by private clients for houses, and I've been in the most hot community group meetings. I used to work for the equivalent of, it's not the equivalent because the city in New York, it never, got, it never gets going, but what we tried to have is an equivalent of the GLC. And as soon as we go to a community meeting, they didn't ask us all that sort of social intention stuff. They wanted to know what the bloody building was going to look like. Where's it going to be? How far are we going to have to walk to the shops, and where's the bloody building going to look like? And, and, and that's what architecture is about. And anybody who doesn't think it's about communicating visual, through the visual means in the 3D out there, meanings and poetry about places, it's crazy. I mean, that's why architecture is so.